everyone, my name's Belle, and I wanted to take a second and welcome you to Wrightsville Assembly of God and our online service. We're so glad that you chose to join us for church today. Our service is going to begin in just a few minutes, and we cannot wait to worship with you. Right now is a great time to hit the share button and invite your friends and family to join you for church today. And I wanted to encourage you to engage with us in the comments throughout the service. Type amen, click the heart emoji, let us know what's speaking to you today. And parents, we have a special service online just for your kids all day today at wrightsvillechurch.com slash online. If this is your first time joining us online, we're so glad that you're here. Our service host is going to be posting a welcome comment. Please like that comment. We would love to know that you're here worshiping with us. And at the end of the service, the host will be posting a link to our online connect card. If you're new today, or if you've been around for a bit and you haven't yet connected with the church, we want to ask you to take a minute and fill out that connect card. We would love the opportunity to follow up with you, say hi, and let you know a little bit more about Wrightsville Assembly of God. We want to take a moment to recognize God's amazing grace upon our lives. You know, God's grace not only saves us, but also enables us to excel in the life that God is calling us to live. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul says, Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. See, our act of giving is a part of the grace that God has put upon our lives. We want to give you an opportunity to walk out that grace by going to wrightsvillechurch.com slash give. We pray that you will continue to excel in all areas of the grace that God has given you.
You know, there are a thousand different things that we could let arrest our thoughts today, but we have made a declaration. My sole devotion, my only focus to worship you. And the reason we say that is because we know that one moment in Jesus' presence can change everything. We know God's been faithful. He's done it before. Come on, let's believe he'll do it again. Walking around these walls I thought by now they fall But you have never failed me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle For you have never failed me yet. Come on, if you know it's true, let the church testify today. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never. I know the night won't last Your word will come to pass My heart will sing your praise again Put a song in our hearts today Jesus, you're still enough Keep me within your love my heart will sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your Lord, rise again today. Turn things around. Come on, let faith begin to build today. No matter how bad it looks, God is able. We trust you, Lord. We know.
Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You've never failed. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands This is my confidence You never fail You never fail You're always faithful God we're asking you to do it again. It is so good to be able to bring the word to you this weekend. Does anybody besides me want to see God do it again? Amen. Come on, come on, man. I, I just... I know it's been a tough week uh, from the national perspective. It's been a difficult week if you've watched the news, uh, if you've been paying attention to current events, but I'm so thankful that the kingdom of God has a longer history than last week. Amen. Amen. The psalmist said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging bread. God is faithful. He has been faithful. He will continue to be faithful. Somebody say, do it again. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, if you're joining us online, we're glad that you're with us. I'm so glad to have uh, some of our church family in the house with me this weekend. And, and I just believe that God wants to do something. And for some of us, it's not, it's not something we've never experienced before, but it's something that we need God to do again, to do it again. Last week was Pentecost Sunday, and we talked about the power of the Spirit. And when the, the Bible talks about people being baptized in the Spirit in the New Testament, it always talks about it in the continual uh, sense of be being filled with the Spirit. In other words, there are some things that God does that we need Him to do again. Amen. And so Pentecost Sunday is not just a, a once a year experience. For the people of God, it needs to be a daily experience. And I believe God wants to do something. But I also believe this. I believe that God wants to do something and He's looking for somebody to do it through. You know, God's always up to something, but the Bible says that Jesus has called us to be his ambassadors, amen? He's called us to be his representatives in the earth, and so he's looking for a people that he can use. Now, don't get me wrong. It, it is not by might, nor by power. It's by the Spirit, saith the Lord, according to the prophecy, but it, it, it's the Spirit of Christ in us doing the work, and God is looking for the us, and so I just want to say that there's one word that has just been on my heart for this weekend, and the word is available. If you're a note taker, write it down. If you're not a note taker, type it in the chat, available, because that's what I want us to lean into with our heart this weekend. I believe God is looking for some people that will be available to God. To let him do a work in and through your life. You know, on Tuesdays, uh, we've been doing this uh, Sunday flashback to where we play a, a service that, that I preached, you know, years ago. And right now, we're, we're playing a series called Legendary. It's a sermon series that I preached several years ago, uh, through most of it through the book of Judges. Men and women that God used to do some legendary things to deliver the people of God. And uh, I watched one of those services on Tuesday with some of you, but I got to thinking about the book of Judges, where a lot of that, those stories come out of. And, and, and as incredible and legendary as those stories are, uh, the thing that's really always been sad to me about the book of Judges is that for all the great things God did, it kind of ends in the same place it started. Like, you don't have to turn there, but let me just, let me just read you the last verse of the book of Judges. It's Judges chapter 21. Verse 25, and it says this, in those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. I mean, that's, that's a very anticlimactic way to end a, a book about heroes, all this redemptive work God did. And at the end of the story, it says, 
There was no king, and everybody just went their own way and did their own thing. But, but here's the truth. The end of the book of Judges is not the end of the story. Come on. The end of the book of Judges is not the end of the story. In fact, the, the way that the book starts is equally fascinating. The way that the book of Judges begins is with this phrase, now it came to pass. And in the original Hebrew, it's even more strange than that. In the original Hebrew, it really means, and it was. And it was. So I got to tell you, if I was writing a book, and I sent it off to an editor, and they opened the first page, and the first line began with, and it was, how many of you know they're going to send that back to me? This thing needs edited. You know, you got to work on your syntax. That is not, you don't start a book with, and it was. But the reason that the story could end the way it was and the reason that it could begin with and it was is because it's all just one part of a bigger story. In fact, there's eight books in the Old Testament that start with the phrase and it was. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, Esther, they all begin with that phrase. Ezekiel, Jonah, They all start with the phrase, and it was, because they're all a part of a bigger story that God is writing. I read about a professional basketball player this week who said he loves to watch game film from the games that they won to relax. And he said, I I like to watch the games we won to help me relax because I know that even in the tightest moments of the game, even in the moments where I was playing at my worst and when we were down and when we were losing... I know how the game ends. Come on, does anybody know how the game ends for the church? We ought to have a winning attitude. Amen. He said, I can relax because I know how it ends. And I'm going to tell you, it might say in Judges 21, 25, in those days, Israel had no king and, and everyone did as they saw fit. But Judges doesn't have the last word. If you want the last word, you got to go all the way to the back of the book. You got to go to Revelation. And the Bible says in Revelation, there is a king. Come on, somebody. The Bible says there is a king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And his kingdom shall know no end. His justice will reign. The enemy will be vanquished and trampled under our feet. And he will receive glory. And our faithfulness will be rewarded. We know how the story ends. God is for us. And we have the opportunity to be on a winning team if we make ourselves available. If you'll make yourself available to God, you know, there's not a Christian that lives now or ever has lived that can do everything, but every one of us can do something. And if we will all do our something, God will work all those things together to fulfill his purpose. You know, I I believe, I I didn't write this, but I believe it's true. That if we will do the small things like they're big things, God will do the big things like they're small things. He'll handle the things that we can't handle if we'll make ourselves available. And I just believe that somebody needs to hear this this weekend. The only ability that God requires is availability. I need to say that to somebody who's, who's already thinking about the same old excuses. Somebody right now, when I say the only ability God requires is availability, you you immediately start thinking, yes, but I'm too old. But while you're saying that, somebody else is saying, yeah, well, I'm too young. Somebody else has said, well, I've made too many mistakes, or or, I don't have enough scripture memorized, or, or I don't this, or I don't that. Listen, the only ability that God requires is availability because God plus you is enough. I didn't do good in math, but I know that equation works. God plus you is enough. And the choice to be available to God is yours. And it's important that you know that. Because the choice to be accountable to God is not. It's not your choice. Whether you want God to use you or not, that's up to you. But one day, here's the reality, friend. Every one of us are going to stand before God. Every one of us are going to give an account for the deeds done in the body. We're going to give an account for the life we live, for the choices we made, for the way we stewarded our time, our talent, our resources. It is your choice today if you want to be available to God. 
But it is not your choice. It is not my choice if I'm going to be accountable to God. You remember the story of Esther? I, I read her story again this week. Esther is an incredible, incredible story. She was a refugee. She had been forced out of her own country because of war. And, and this beautiful young Jewish girl was living in exile in Babylon. But because of the beauty and the grace on her life, she won the attention of the king. And, and Esther became the queen of that whole region of 127 provinces. She became the queen in that region. And when the Jewish people living there were facing, they were facing being extinguished. I mean, it was a genocide. They were about to be murdered by the evil plots of a man named Haman. When, when they found out about that, Esther's cousin, Mordecai, sent a letter to her to be delivered to her in the king's palace. And he said to her, Esther, You've got to do something about this. And, and when Esther received the letter from Mordecai, she did what we do way too often. She began immediately to list all of her excuses. She began to say all the reasons that I, I couldn't, I probably shouldn't. Even if I did, I don't know if it would have any impact. And she began to think of all the reasons that she shouldn't say something, that she shouldn't make herself available in this moment for God to use her. And in response to her list of excuses, Mordecai sends another message. I, I want to show you the message. It's in Esther chapter 4. It's easy for me to find because it's highlighted in my Bible. Maybe you ought to highlight it in yours. Esther chapter 4, verse 12, in response to all the reasons she gave for not making herself available to God, here's what Mordecai said to her. It says in verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I, I love verse 14 because Mordecai is saying, look, Esther, you are not the Savior. He said, God is going to deliver his people. In other words, he'll find another way if you don't step up. Make no mistake about it. This is, not a, this is not a cry for your help. This is not a plea. We're not depending on you. We're depending on the Lord. But he's also saying, look, Esther, it's your choice if you want to be available for God to use. But it's not your choice if you're going to be accountable to God. Because he goes a little farther and he says, if you choose not to step up in this moment, if you choose to remain silent, Think about this. He says to Esther, this young girl that he raised as a daughter, his own family, he said, judgment is coming to your house. The judgment of God is coming to you and to your family, not for your actions, but for your inactions. He said, the judgment of God is coming not because of what you said, but because of your silence. Now, now let me just speak personally for a minute. Because as a pastor, I'm always very careful to make sure that I don't try to risk the scriptures out of context and make it say what I want it to say. I'm not trying to make this scripture say something that it doesn't say. I understand the context. I understand the Jewish people facing genocide and all of that. But, but let me just be personal with you. Let me tell you how this scripture ministered to my heart and to my life when I read it again this week. When I read these words of Mordecai, warning Esther about God's judgment on her silence. I couldn't help but think about all of the voices that have been crying out in America this last week. I couldn't help but think about all of the, the cries for justice as people are marching in our streets and, and kneeling in our parks. I, I couldn't read this warning and not take it personal to my life this week and, and ask myself the question, 
How can I remain silent in the king's house when my brothers and sisters are crying out? And make no mistake about it, whatever kind of Christian you are, whatever color Christian you are, red, yellow, black, or white, if you're a Christian, you have a seat in the king's house. Amen. Come on. The Bible says that we, in Ephesians, we are, we are right now seated in the heavenly places with Christ Jesus. So because I know that God sees me as royalty, I have to ask myself the question that Mordecai asked. Perhaps, he said, perhaps. The Lord has put you in this royal position for such a time as this. And as I thought about that, and I thought about what I'm seeing in the news, I couldn't help but remember a a story that I read and even preached about several years ago from this platform. A quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that he wrote from a Birmingham jail in 1963. He said these words. They were true in Esther's day. They were true in 1963, and I believe they're just as true in our day today. He said, we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words of bad people, but for the appalling silence of good people. You know, if we're honest, we would all acknowledge that that issue that I just mentioned that God was dealing with me about this week is just one very important issue amongst a number of issues that God has called us to action. He's called us to be available. He's called us to be a voice and not just an echo in the culture. He's called us to be a prophet to the culture and not a product of the culture. And we could go down the list of so many things that God wants us to be called to action for. I was thinking about the verse this week in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 17. The word of the Lord. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow, just a few of the causes that he's asking us to jump into with our action. Go with me really quick to the gospel of Matthew chapter 25, because Jesus gives us a picture here at the end of Matthew's gospel. And the picture is what it's going to be like on judgment day when Jesus comes back into his kingdom. When Jesus comes to establish his earthly kingdom, he says that there's going to be a separation to those on the right and those on the left, to the sheep and the goats. And he says in Matthew 25, beginning in verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. He said, I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you look after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. But look at verse 37. It says, in that moment, then the righteous will answer him, Lord, When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? Hear this today, church. Verse 40, Jesus said, the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. That's the picture that Jesus gave us of his kingdom. That's what Jesus said it's going to be like. He said the distinguishing mark, the thing that's going to separate the sheep and the goats, those to the right and those to the left, the thing that's going to separate them are those that were willing to be available to do the activity of God in the earth. That's the difference. That's the difference. And every example that Jesus gave of our obedience it begins with availability. You know, it's, in, it's inconvenient to visit somebody in prison. It's inconvenient to feed the hungry. It's inconvenient 
to go and visit those who are sick. But every obedience begins with our availability. So what does it look like to say, I'm available to be used by God? I'm going I'm to give you three, three things here. And they all start with the letter C. Three words. The first word is covenant. Covenant. What does it look like to be available to God? It begins with understanding that it's about a covenant. See, from the very beginning of the Bible, God communicated that the way to have a relationship with him was through a blood covenant. That's why when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the Bible says God made clothes for them. In other words, he sacrificed an animal. As far as we know, no animals had been sacrificed yet, but God shed blood to restore a relationship with man. When God established the covenant with Abraham. You remember the story. He told Abraham to go and to get a, get a couple of uh, a heifer. And he got these animals and he got birds and, and he was supposed to cut them in two. And, and then God came and visited him like a flaming fire in the night. And what did he do? He established a covenant right there amidst that sacrifice. Later, God asked Abraham to establish a covenant with him. He said, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac, and he went up to the mountain with his son Isaac, but God intervened and he said, no, 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 Abraham, you're not the one in this relationship that's going to sacrifice their son. I'll take care of that. And he gave Abraham a a ram in the thicket and he provided a blood sacrifice to communicate the promise. The Bible says in the New Testament, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In other words, the only way that we can come to God is through the shed blood of his son, Jesus Christ. The way that we make ourselves available to God is by realizing that this is a covenant. It's not a contract. How many of you know there's a difference between a contract and a covenant? You have a contract with your cell phone provider. And how many of you know if you stay on your phone too long or use too much Wi-Fi, that thing can change quick? Or if somebody else comes out with a better plan that can save you money or bundle some things together, you can get out of that contract. You can break that thing really quick. Or maybe you've bought a house before and you sat down at the table and you know there's a lot of paperwork to buy a house. And you get this big old stack of paper and you initial here and you initial there and you turn the page, you initial over here, you initial over there until you finally get to the last page and then you sign it. And all those initials are your way of saying, I see everything in it. It's been explained to me. I understand. I understand what you're asking me. I I initial here. And then on the back page, I'm going to sign the contract. And now I'm locked in. But a covenant is different. A covenant is like looking at that stack of papers and just signing the top page without even knowing what's in it. A covenant says, I'm in this thing. Now, this weekend, I have the privilege, as I often do, of doing a wedding. I'm performing Tommy and Steph's wedding, and they're going to stand at this altar this weekend, and they're not going to sign a contract. They're going to form a covenant, and I'm going to add my name to that sealed document. And they're not going to say, if you will, I will. If you do, I might. They're going to say, for better or worse. In sickness and health, richer or poorer, until death parts us. That's a covenant. We got to understand that's what it is to say, God, I'm available. I'm not available if it feels right. I'm not available if I'm in the mood. I'm not, I'm not available when, when it's convenient. I'm in a covenant relationship with you. And when you say, Jesus, I give you my life, you mean the whole thing. You mean your time, your talent, your treasure, your mind, your heart, your hands. When you say, Jesus, I give you my life, you're saying, Jesus, I'm in a covenant relationship with you. Now, let me give you the second word. The second word is cause. Isn't that a popular word today? Everybody's got a cause, right? Everybody's got a cause. Everybody's got something they're excited about. Everybody's got something they want to be a part of. I want you to know to say that, God, I'm available to you means that I'm going to be a part 
of a cause. And when you say, God, I'm available, you got to know that there is one cause that is preeminent above every other cause, and that is the kingdom cause. When you say, God, I'm available to you, you're saying, this, my life is about a kingdom cause. Cause. That's why when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, here's what he said. He said, when you pray, say this, your kingdom come, your will be done. Because our prayers and our desires are submitted to a kingdom cause. That's why when Jesus stood before Pilate in John chapter 18, Pilate said, are are, are you a king? And Jesus said, you say that I am, but it is for this cause that I was born and that I came into the earth to proclaim the truth. That's why when John the Baptist was, was preaching and his ministry was, was thriving, and then all of a sudden some of his followers began to leave his ministry, and they began to follow after Jesus. And people ask him, man, what, how do you feel about that? How do you feel about people leaving your ministry and following Jesus? And John the Baptist said this. He said, I must decrease so that he may increase. I just wonder how many of us in the church today could say that with a pure heart amidst a culture that is screaming out loud to be heard when everyone wants their their voice and their hashtag to trend and to say, I want people to know what I'm about today. How many of us could say, I must become less if it means the kingdom becoming more? It's about a kingdom cause. Again, let, let, me just, let me just be personal with you. Let me tell you how this fleshes out in my life this week. You know, election season is in full swing now. It's in full swing. And, and there, there's a lot of noise. And it's only going to get louder this year. And, and if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, I, I can lose my voice and my focus on a kingdom cause, it can be drowned out by the noise of of a candidate's cause or a political debate or some issue that's going on in our world. As I'm thinking about this and praying about this week, I've just come to this conclusion. I actually came to it a long time ago, but I just needed to make it my prayer this week, and I need to make it my proclamation right now. My allegiance as a born-again believer, as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, is to a higher office than even the president of the United States. My allegiance is to a higher office, and so I have to be careful. And let me say, I believe you have to be careful to make sure that your impact in the kingdom isn't divided by blue and red. That your impact in the kingdom isn't divided by political lines. I mean, as far as I can tell, there's, there, there's four really kingdom-oriented causes in the Gospels. Rac- racial reconciliation is right at the top of that list. Justice for the, for the powerless, the sanctity of marriage, and the sanctity of life. Those things are all kingdom-oriented priorities. But there's not a political party that reflects all of those priorities at any given time. And so if you are kingdom-oriented, you are not always going to fit in politically or culturally. I'm okay with that. You can work out your own salvation, but I'm okay with that. I recognize that my cause, whatever it might be, is submitted to a kingdom cause. Because when I say, God, I'm available to you, what I'm saying is, Lord, your kingdom come and your will be done in the earth as it is in heaven. I think when when we as Christians get caught up, in the factions and the divisions, and we get caught up in the the noise of social media arguments and debates, all of a sudden what happens is we get focused on the causes down here and we lose sight of the cause up there. Jesus told us what a kingdom cause looks like in Matthew 6, 33. He said, but seek first the kingdom." And his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. He said that's what it looks like to be available to God. 
Your availability to God means there's a priority in your causes. It doesn't mean the other causes aren't important. It doesn't mean they're not valid. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't get involved or engaged in some you know, civic duty. Absolutely. But it means there's a priority list that I am seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That word righteousness, in, in the Chinese language, they have an incredible way of depicting the word righteousness. You know, the Chinese language uses like pictures and symbols to communicate words. And so the symbol for the word righteousness is actually two different symbols. The first is a lamb. It's the symbol of a lamb. And the second is a person. And what's so awesome about the Chinese uh, word for righteousness is the image is a lamb with a person up underneath it. And that is such a beautiful biblical description of righteousness. The Bible says that, that we are hidden with Christ in God, that when God sees us, he doesn't see our sin. When he looks down at us from heaven, he sees the righteousness of the perfect lamb of God. And so to be righteous is to say, I want to come under the lamb. I want, I want to come under the lamb. I want to submit my life to the lamb. That's, that's why when Paul was speaking in Romans chapter 14, he said, do not let your good be evil spoken of. Because the kingdom of God is not about what you eat or what you drink. It's about righteousness. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about peace. It's about joy. He said, don't, don't, let, your, don't let your good be evil spoken of by the things that you do. What was he saying? He was saying, your cause determines your conduct. And that's true, whether you're a Christian or not. Your cause determines your conduct. And so when Paul was writing to the church at Ephesus, he explained how to conduct yourself. How do we do this? If I'm going to be available to God, if I'm going to be focused on a kingdom cause, what does it look like? He said in Ephesians chapter 4, this is what it looks like. This is how you conduct yourself, church. Verse 1, he said, as, prisoners, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of of the calling you have received. In other words, live worthy of the cause. Jesus said in Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. That's the cause, to redeem. And he said, live your life worthy of that cause. Verse 2, he says this. Paul writes, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. In love. Did you know that is one of 59 places in the New Testament where the Bible tells us how to treat one another? Why? Because your cause determines your conduct. And if you profess to be kingdom oriented, you ought to act like it. So he says, be humble, be gentle, be patient, bear with one another in love. I love verse 3. Listen to verse 3. He says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort. I had somebody give me a compliment online this last week for the way that I always stay calm and joyful. <laughs> now, I appreciated the compliment. But I got to be honest, when I read it, my first thought was, sister, you don't know how hard it is. <laughs> Look, I ain't trying to fool anybody. I have to work hard to be calm and joyful. And, and my wife is in the room, so I ain't going to lie up here. I am not always calm and joyful. But Paul said, make every effort. You got to put in the work. Why? Because the cause determines the conduct. Listen, if you're more concerned about being right than righteous, you're not focused on a kingdom cause. Amen. See, to, to, to be righteous is to submit my ideas, my opinions, 
under the lamb. To say, I'm putting this man under the lamb. I got my views, I got my thoughts, I got my opinions, but I'm going to submit myself to the lamb. Jesus said this, John 13, 35, this ought, to, this ought to awaken the heart of the church today. He said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Wow, when somebody says that, we ought to lean in. By what? By this, everyone will know you're my disciples. What's the secret sauce to the kingdom? How do we let the whole world know about Jesus? Here it is. If you love one another. That's it. He said, the greatest apologetic of the church, the greatest defense of the kingdom of God is the way we treat each other. It's our love for one another. So let me ask you a question today, church. Is your conduct a witness to the love of Jesus? Or are you a spoon stirring in the bowl of controversy? Can I just challenge us, church? Don't be a spoon. <laughs> Put that in the comments. Confuse somebody that just logged in. What in the world is he talking about? Don't be a spoon. You know, Paul used a different word to describe I'm using the word cause. He used a stronger word. His word was crucified. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, I live. But it's not I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He's saying, it's not my life anymore. My life, I was crucified. I've come under the lamb, to live out his righteousness. It's, my, it's his life through my body. If you're going to be available to God, it's about a covenant. No prenup. No pre-existing conditions. No bargaining. If you do, then I will. Listen, you got to be all in. You got to be all in or all out, but if you're going to say, God, I'm available to you, it's a covenant relationship, and it's a cause. It's so important that we know that. You can't live for these lower causes. Again, I'm not saying, I'm not saying they don't matter. They do matter. We, Jesus said, you're in this world, but not of it. But you are in it. <laughs> so, so let's not just be like, well, I'm not up. No, 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 we are in it. And we're called to be salt and light. So there are plenty of causes that matter. But we can't live for those causes. There's a priority to our causes. It's the kingdom first. But there's a third and final word that I want to give you. If you're going to make yourself available to God, and this is really the one that it begins with. And the word is confession. Confession. Psalm 24, verse 3 and 4, ask this question. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands. Well, fortunately for us, that's everybody right now, right? <laughs> Amen. We got that part. <laughs> that's not the end of the sentence. And a pure heart who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false God. In other words, he's not just talking about outward cleanliness. He's not just talking about not going to the wrong places or hanging with the wrong crowd. He's not talking about the optics of how holy or spiritual we think you are. That has nothing to do with how high you can climb into the presence of God. It's he who has clean hands and a pure heart. The one whose heart and mind is focused on the Lord. Listen, the only thing that disqualifies you from being used by God. It's not your talent. It's not your history. It's certainly not your genealogy or your nationality. The only thing that disqualifies any of us from being used by God is sin. Sin. And that's why I'm so thankful for the promise in 1 John 1, 9. I love that verse. It says to us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just 
and he will forgive us and purify us from all unrighteousness. In other words, if we'll confess our sins, he'll bring us back under the Lamb. He'll bring us back to a place of righteousness. He will bring us back to a place where when God looks down at your life, he doesn't see the sinful man. He doesn't see the sinful woman because you're under the lamb. He sees the perfection of his own son that purchased your redemption, that established a blood covenant through his own body and his own blood shed on the cross. It begins with confession. You know, the word confession, it it, it means a change of mind and a change of direction. Confession doesn't just mean I'm sorry. Confession means I'm changing my mind about my decisions, about my thoughts, and I'm changing my direction. I'm going to live my life in a new way. I'm going to move in a new direction. Listen, today, hear me, today, God wants to do it again. He wants to show himself faithful. He wants to show himself mighty on behalf of them that believe. But he's looking for someone who will be available, fully committed, fully available to him to say, I'm all in, not conditionally in, I'm in covenant, I'm all in, God, and I'm committed to your cause above every other cause, above all the noise, God, I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. That's what he wants, and he wants that from you. Whether you've known the Lord for years and years and served the Lord, or whether you've never had a relationship with Jesus Christ, confession is the key that unlocks the door for your ability to be used by God. Confession is the key that unlocks that door. Because the only thing that separates you from your potential in God is the sin in your life. The sin in my life works the same way. But if you will confess your sins, 1 John 1, 9 tells us, he's faithful, he's just, he'll forgive you of your sins, he'll purify you from all your unrighteousness. And that can happen right now. I want to pray for you. If you need to confess any sin to God, while I pray out loud, I want you to pray wherever you're at. Father, right now, Lord, we take a posture of humility. Right now, God, we humble our hearts before you. Lord, we confess the sins that we've committed. Lord, we confess the sins of omission, those things that we know we should have done that honored you and we just chose not to. God, today, Lord, we want to align our lives with what you're doing, with what you have planned. We don't want to just stop at saying, God, would you do something? We recognize today that you have called us. You've commissioned us. You've given us the power of your Holy Spirit. You sent us into this world to be your representatives. And God, it's not enough to just say, would you do it again? God, we're saying, would you do it through me? Would you do it in me? God, I recognize today that whatever you want to do in society or in this world, It has to begin in the hearts of your people. It has to begin in me. So God, today, I confess. I confess my sin. I acknowledge my failures. God, forgive me. Lord, let me be washed and made clean by the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross. Lord, bring me into a covenant with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, friends, we're going to sing one more song of worship. This song has been on repeat in my heart all week. When you hear the words, even if you don't know the song, you'll know why. But as we sing this last song, it's simply about making ourselves available to God. As we sing this song, uh, I want you to know that our online hosts are ready to pray for you. Some of our church families logged on with you. We want to pray together. I want to encourage you. Jump in with us and just lift up your prayer to the Lord. If you want somebody to follow up with you and connect with you, there are ways that are posted that that we can reach out to you and minister to you throughout this week. But let's take these moments together before we disconnect, before we log off and move on to our day. 
Let's take these moments together. Take a posture of worship and say, Lord, I'm available. You can use me.
Thank you so much for joining us online today. We want you to know that we are praying for you and we believe that God is going to continue to move in and through your life this week. If you have a prayer request and you haven't left a comment yet, please do so now. Our church family would love to have the chance to pray with you. Our service host is going to be posting a link to our online connect card. If you're new with us today, please take a minute and fill out that connect card. We would love to have the opportunity to follow up with you, say hi, and let you know a little bit more about Wrightsville Assembly of God. If you would like to give online, you can do that right now at wrightsvillechurch.com give. We want to encourage you to stay connected with the church throughout the week. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube page and check out some of our previous messages. I hope you have a wonderful week.